Hi, today we've got this soldering iron to take a look at. It's the AE680D Smart Soldering Station and it's from a brand that I've never heard of before and it's quite difficult to read from the logo but it is actually ATE Tool. And this one caught my eye in particular when I was browsing AliExpress because I thought this was a T12 soldering station and I thought these were like high thermal capacity cartridges because they had kind of this bulbous end. But it turns out, uh, and in the listing it says, that these cartridges are actually mains powered. Uh, so apparently there's no voltage conversion or anything like that. It does have temperature control, so the control loop is done on mains. Uh, but these cartridges accept the mains potential directly, which is uh, quite unique these days. In the old days, all of the solder irons used to be pretty much uh, a direct 230 volt heating element in the um, actual solder iron itself. Uh, but we don't seem to see that very often anymore. Most of the soldering irons with a temperature control seem to be 24 volts or something like that. So we're going to take a look at that in a moment. First of all, uh, we'll just have a quick word from our sponsor, PCB Way, who provided these new uh, soldering test PCBs. And I've got some of these uh, with no coating, so just copper as well, because uh, we're going to try and look at some new solder and some new flux again, hopefully this year, uh, because the listings that I had before so this video is sponsored by PCBWay who offer a wide range of manufacturing services including PCB manufacture so you can get your low cost prototype PCBs manufactured here or if you're looking for something a little bit more demanding or making production level PCBs you can select advanced PCB where there are significantly more options including board specifications and board materials. They also offer some mechanical manufacturing capabilities including CNC machining, 3D printing, sheet metal fabrication or if you're looking for higher volume type manufacturing, they also do injection molding. And don't forget the PCB Way community where you can have a look at other people's projects that they've shared on here, or you can upload your own and share them with the community. And one that I found quite interesting showcases PCB Way's new capability of printing full color silk screens on here. So if you're interested in PCB Way's manufacturing capabilities, then don't forget to visit them at pcbway.com. The soldering iron is rated at 80 watts, which is a lot more believable compared to some of the recent soldering stations that we've looked at. Those soldering stations suffered because they either had a small transformer uh, that wasn't capable of delivering the rated power, or just because the transformer didn't have a high enough voltage to support the power rating. Whereas this is powered from the mains, so the power rating is basically set by the resistance of the cartridge. There's no problem with supplying 80 watts from the mains, and the electronics for doing the switching for the thermal temperature control shouldn't uh, really struggle with that kind of current. So the unit is assembled mainly from plastic. There's these silicone sleeves, so one where you hold it, and it does feel uh, quite old-fashioned now because it is actually quite a chunky soldier iron here, uh, but it feels pretty comfortable to hold. We've got a very small strain relief. The body ends about here, so we've only got about uh, 15 millimeters of strain relief here, uh, so I think this is more for aesthetics. We've got some silicone wire, but that appears to only be up to the control unit, and then we've got PVC, uh, just normal mains cable, up to the mains plug. Now the cartridge itself doesn't just come unplugged, or actually it's coming a little bit loose, but there is a grub screw under this silicone sleeve, which is supposed to be able to peel back. So a little bit tight to pull back, but then it exposes this grub screw here. There's just the one there, a couple of turns, and the cartridge comes out quite freely. Now I notice there's no indent or anything like that for that grub screw to sit in. So when you tighten that grub screw, you're actually just compressing the neck just here it's just tightening directly into it so potentially if you went overboard with this you could cause some damage to the cartridge uh, but that's what they've gone with anyway presumably for cost now it does say that you can't hot swap these cartridges and i wouldn't want to uh, with these being powered from the mains which is probably part of the reason why they have that grub screw in there but an interesting um, thing here is that they've got the two ring terminals here uh, potentially another terminal for the overall body, which you would expect to be earthed. Uh, but I'm not quite sure how they're doing the heating plus the temperature measurement with potentially only two contacts, unless they are uh, measuring between the earth and one of these terminals. I'm not entirely sure, so we'll have to do some measurements soon. Uh, but that, I thought that was quite interesting, but we'll push that back in there. In terms of the user interface, we've just got three buttons on the soldering iron, so an up and down button for scrolling through the menu or changing the temperature and then a function button here to enter the menu and do other functions. There's also a little LED in here which illuminates when the heater 
is receiving power. Uh, but these buttons control a graphical user interface on a little 0.96 inch OLED on the little control unit. Now there's no other controls on this unit so uh, this presumably has the switching for the heating element but I might be wrong. Uh, there's no screws on here or anything like that so I think we're going to have to test the soldering iron first and then we'll take it all apart. Uh, but this is a little base that has a sticky pad at the bottom and some magnets in it and that kind of holds the control unit in place so that you can have it pointing at you. Uh, it's quite a nice arrangement actually being able to switch the temperature on the handpiece itself um, just to control the user interface on here. Uh, and then also in the kit we've got this little silicone sleeve which is quite a nice design actually. That just slips over here so that you can pull out a cartridge while it's still warm. And then we have one of these little flimsy cradles which aren't that much use but it just keeps the um, soldering iron off your workspace. Let's just test one of these cartridges. First of all we'll see if we've got any uh, continuity between the metal body and either of these two terminals here. So no, nothing there. What about between these two? It is about 130 ohms. Let's see how much power that is. Uh, so the supply voltage here is 230 volts divided by 130 and that says about 407 watts. That's quite high. Uh, presumably the resistance will go up when the temperature goes up. And then we'll also just check the earthing arrangement. So I've got one probe here on the cartridge one on the earth pin, and yeah, we get a decent low impedance. What about to the other terminals here? So yeah, nothing to live or neutral. Right, let's power this up. I'm not sure if it starts heating up straight away or whether we have to take it out of standby, but we'll plug it in, just taking note of the power consumption up here. So plugged it in, we've got the menu, and then the temperature. Climbing rapidly, and I think we've seen, well, that looked like 175 watts for a moment there from the mains power supply, dropping down to a more reasonable 100 and then right down. And if you look on here, we've actually got a little bar graph showing how the heating element is being driven. And then we've got that pulsing LED, which is pulsing on and off every time the heating element is getting power. So in terms of the user interface, we've got a very clear user interface here. So the temperature showing us 340 degrees C, and we can adjust the temperature in one degree steps by pressing the plus and minus button and then if we hold it down it goes very quickly uh, in temperature and what I thought was a preset is actually just an indication of how far uh, within the temperature range you are so uh, we're down at sort of one and a half bars and as we increase the temperature that increases all the way up to 500 degrees C so quite a temperature range there for you to do your soldering with and then in terms of the other functions we've got this function button and if we press this button once for a short period of time it actually goes into sleep mode and turns off the heating element so if you don't want to just unplug it you're just having a five minute break or something uh, you can press that button and it turns off the heating element completely which is quite nice and then just one more button push to turn it back on and then we've got the user menu here if we hold down this button we go into there that does actually turn off the heating element as well completely so we've got lock which actually just locks the temperature so when you turn it on it just stays at a fixed temperature and if we scroll through we've got standby and sleep so we do have both the standby and the sleep mode on here and we've got an accelerometer inside the handpiece so if it detects no movement at this case for five minutes then it'll drop the temperature down to 250 and then if there's no movement for a further 10 minutes, then it turns off the heating element completely and you have to wake it up by pressing that function button, which is quite nice. And if we do want to change the temperature here, given how much power we can drive into this heating element, we can probably adjust that. So we press uh, the function button and we can adjust that down. Let's change it up to 180 degrees C and then we press the function button again and that stores it and we can scroll through and then when we get these little dots at the top here, that takes us back to the menu. Then we've got compensation and calibration. So these are two different ways of calibrating the cartridge. The first one is compensation and what this does is basically if you uh, do what I normally do which is if we test it on a temperature calibrator and let's say it says 330 degrees on here and then we test it on the calibrator and it says 340 
we just go into this menu here and change that to minus 10 and that would fix sort of the offset. But if we want to um, do a full calibration, we go into calibration here and what it will do is it will set the temperature to a, a specific temperature. You read off what it is on your temperature calibrator and you test it in here. Then it does a, another point and you read off what your calibrator says and then you enter it in here. You know, it's got sort of a two-point calibration. Now you can mess up the system uh, with this calibration function here if you don't have a proper calibrator it will change the slope and then it will be unstable. Um, and then we've got interface here let's press OK on there and we've got English or Chinese we've got the contrast and then we've also got the ability to rotate the display. And then we'll go back to the main user system here uh, unit Celsius we can reset it back to factory defaults and it's on software version 4. And that's about it. And then we go back and it goes back to our heating screen. So very simple user interface. It's actually very usable and really quite readable. Let's check out the calibration. So we've got the calibrator here and we've got the temperature set to 350. Probably about 9 degrees out there. Let's see if we can adjust it. So we go into the menu compensation and we want to add 9 degrees so yeah about right there that's pretty good let's clean the tip and let's try a little bit of soldering on these pads here I don't expect these to present any problem these are gold pads here we've probably got the wrong cartridge here with this conical we're not going to get as much power as we'd like into some of these pads but it shouldn't present an issue for soldering if we hold it at quite a shallow angle. And yeah, that seems to be flowing really quite nicely. Not making a huge amount of difference to the power consumption on the power graph, as you can see. And this is pretty stable on here, so it's not really seeing these pads as much of a load. But the solder flows absolutely fine, as you can see, on these Enig pads. Let's see how we get on with the largest tip that was available for this soldering iron. So we'll get it heating up. Now we've got a slightly higher thermal demand PCB just here. So I mean, it, the graph shows that we're easily capable of putting 85 or more watts into the soldering tip. The question is, can we actually get the heat out from the tip? We might be limited by the geometry that's available. There's certainly no problem with the capability of the heater in the cartridge but I'm not sure where the placement of the thermocouple is if it has one and also how the heater sits within this cartridge and how conductive the tip actually is to get the heat out because the solder is dragging just a little bit as I move the solder iron around this high thermal demand PCB. It's got four layers on here all tied together with thermal wires and we don't get quite as good behaviour compared to the JBC or Metcal stations. If you look at the graph, the average is about 45 watts or so. So with a little bit of force we managed to get inside. Unfortunately uh, the plastics are damaged. This was all glued together. So I probably won't be able to put this soldering iron back together again. But this is what the PCB inside the handpiece looks like. So we've got the little terminals here. We've got one at earth and then the two heater terminals. We've got some tactile switches with a few passive components. The LED and what we've got here is a little vibration sensor. And if you've not seen these before, these are just little switches and normally they are closed but if there's a small amount of vibration that is amplified by the armature inside here and the switch basically opens for a brief period of time. Here's the schematic for the little PCB in the handpiece. So we've got a switch live coming from the little control unit which controls the power into the heater and then we go back to the mains neutral 
And on the main PCB, the mains neutral and the zero volts for the electronics is actually tied together. It's the same potential. We've also got a little LED and a simple series resistor to indicate when power is being provided to the heater and then the shell of the heater is connected to uh, mains earth. And then we've got a analog uh, to digital line here. So this obviously goes off to the ADC on the microcontroller. So I think we're biased up to the supply rail for the micro with a little resistor. And then what we've got is the three control switches on the front of the handpiece, each with a different resistor here, so that when you've got this at a fixed resistance, depending on which button is being pressed, you get a different voltage on this line, which can be read back. And even if we press multiple buttons together, we should be able to tell that multiple buttons have been pressed together. And then we have the vibration switch with a little series diode here and basically when that switch is closed which is when it's not moving this is clamped down at 0 0.6 volts now one thing to notice here there is no kind of thermocouple or anything like that on the heater we just have the mains connection to the heater so i think um, they must be using the resistance of the heater somehow to control the temperature but it was pretty well controlled when i checked it on the calibrator um, but that's the only thing i could think they're doing uh, it is just showing up as a plain resistance when I connect it to an LCR meter. Here's the PCB inside the little control unit. So what we've got is the mains coming in on the left. We've got a common mode choke and then a capacitive dropper. And here's our little inrush limiting resistor. This is probably a fusible resistor. So if all goes wrong, then this resistor will blow up as well. We've got a little film capacitor, a little snubber arrangement there. A Zener diode to supply the electronics on the PCB with a 47 mic 35 volt capacitor and then we've got our triac for controlling the heater. Let's unscrew this and have a look on the other side. On this side we see we've not just got the Zener diode as the regulator we've also got a proper book regulator arrangement just here and then the microcontroller must be hiding underneath the OLED. Let's see if we can move that out of the way. And what do we have? an HC32F005. And someone's put the details for this one on GitHub. So the HC32F005 has a little ARM Cortex-M0 Plus microcontroller. In terms of the temperature control, this is the triac that is controlling the power into the heater. It goes down to this brown wire labeled Z on here. And then on this side, it comes back into Q2 and then some arrangement of resistors over here so I think what they're doing is in the amount of time that they've got the heater turned off for because we always saw that blue LED blinking on the handpiece it never actually stayed on continuously so when the heater is off I think they're measuring the resistance of the heater now that was measuring sort of a few hundred ohms cold maybe it goes up but it is quite impressive that they've engineered this to give that kind of accuracy because it was pretty good when I measured it on the temperature calibrator so um, yeah they've done quite a good job here of working with the constraints that they've got in this system. So this wouldn't be a bad soldering iron for someone who's just getting started in electronics or just wants a hobby iron. Uh, I didn't mention the price before but this one's coming in at about £37 in the UK so on the lower end of the scale in terms of cost and the performance isn't too bad. It struggled there a little bit with the 2p coin test but it just wasn't putting the power into the coin so I think the limitation with that type of control loop where they're using the heater to read back the temperature uh, possibly means that we're not getting an accurate temperature measurement and therefore it suffers in high thermal demand applications. But for general purpose soldering, um, it would be absolutely fine. The main limitation really is just the lack of cartridges available. Uh, these two on the left I think are probably the most useful. A lot of people like these for doing surface mount soldering. Uh, so these five that you've got here would cover most tasks uh, except for, sort of as I mentioned, high thermal demand applications. But the construction, certainly not too bad, and uh, the general design of it is also quite nice as well. So uh, it does seem to work okay and quite safely. So uh, that's the ATE Tool AE680D. Hope you found the video useful, and if you've got any thoughts or comments, don't forget to leave them in the comments section down below. And also, if you're thinking about getting some PCBs or other mechanical parts made, don't forget to visit our sponsor for this video. PCB way who enabled me to be able to get hold of all of these various types of soldier nine. So I hope you found the video useful and until next time, thanks for watching.